uh, August 20th meeting of the North Lincoln Charter Review Committee is being recorded here in North Lincoln City Hall. All members are present except for Bill and Gaffney and uh, Bill Floyd. Uh, first uh, order of business tonight is to be uh, to uh, accept the minutes from the July 16th meeting. Second. Any questions, additions, changes? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Abstention. Robbie abstains. Okay. Um, we have an out of town guest to be here this evening, and uh, to accommodate him, I'm going to have him speak next. Uh, he is Wesley Slate, he's the city clerk in Maryland. Secretary of the Massachusetts City Clerk's Association will be delivering uh, some remarks and then will be available to answer questions about the issue of possible recommendation of changing the city clerk in your campus from the elected to an appointed position. Um, he provided us with some backup material uh, from Beverly, the Beverly Charter that, that pertains to the city clerk. I think everybody on the committee has a copy of this. Anybody in the audience would like a copy, they are available. Wesley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everyone. Uh, as Dan said, I'm Wes Slate. I'm the city clerk of Beverly, and I'm also the secretary of the Massachusetts City Clerks Association. I'm very grateful for the invitation to speak with you tonight and relay our own experience in Beverly in some sense of how other cities in the Commonwealth are organized with, re with respect to their city clerks. <clears throat> to begin with, Mass General Law requires that each city and town have at the very least two officials, a treasurer and a clerk. And the 50 cities of the 351 cities and towns all have a clerk who is elected or appointed, in most cases, by the legislative body of the city, namely the city council or the mayor. This is not to say that this is what Northampton should have or that there is a correct answer that we should all adopt a perfect solution to how we should be set up. Rather, it's up to each community, to each city, in our case, cities, to determine what arrangement best works for us, is closest to what our citizens need, and what best reflects the unique character history, and culture of our city. I can tell you that from our experience in Beverly, we're 20 miles north of Boston on the North Shore, that although we border the cities of Salem and Peabody, and also the town of Danvers, we're similar to those two cities. My colleagues Eileen Simmons and Tim Spanos, the clerks in Salem and Peabody respectively, do not operate in exactly the same way as I do. And though we are all elected or appointed by our, our respective city councils, we do not mirror each other exactly, regardless of our geographic proximity, nor our common historical roots on the North Shore. The voters of Beverly adopted our own home rule charter in Beverly in the mid-1990s, after a similar effort to your own by our charter commission. The effort to do this began with the realization that our city was a very different place than it had been when the former charter, and I couldn't pin down the year, but it was very old, had been adopted. To be more specific, Beverly back then was effectively run by the then Board of Aldermen, and it was all men, who made all the decisions affecting the day-to-day -day operation of the city. The Board of Aldermen hired, fired, and promoted employees. They conducted the business of the city and directed all of our employees. There was a mayor, but he, again, they were all men, tended to simply carry out the clear management direction of the aldermen and had nowhere near the power and authority of our present mayor. So it was that that charter commission in the mid-90s debated the organization of our city government, specifically moving toward a strong mayor form debated on a two-year term or four-year term, settled on a two-year term, and giving the mayor the authority of a chief operating officer, chief procurement officer, and where, other than the school department and the city clerk, everyone who worked for the city reported directly or indirectly to that mayor. 
the Board of Aldermen became what is now the City Council and retained approval of the Mayor's budget, confirmation of the appointments, granting of permits and licenses through my office, and other such matters. The Charter Commission also created the position of City Council Budget Management Analyst, who reported to the, to the Council, who had full access to our financial system, Munis, and whose compensation was a line item in the clerk's budget set by charter to be up, of, up to one half of the finance director treasurer's salary. We have been very fortunate in Beverly to have had only two individuals serve in that position in the 20 plus years of the charter. Most recently, for the last couple of years, Mr. Gerard Perry, Jerry Perry, a retired bureau chief from the Mass Department of Revenue Division of Local Services has developed strong collaborative relationships with the mayor and his team and can offer independent analysis of financial matters that come to the council separate from whatever recommendations made to them by the mayor and his administration. In my own case, my office is similar to your clerks in function. We run elections and certify the results. We handle vital records, births, deaths, and marriages. We maintain historic documents. Beverly was formed in 1626 along with Salem, so we have a lot of those. And we regular have regularly have batches of those documents sent out for restoration and preservation using my own city budget line item, the Community Preservation Act that we've had for the last six or seven years, and outside grant funding as available. I am also the clerk of the city council, which is different, a justice of the peace and a commissioner to qualify public Individuals, public officials, I can swear people in. There are five of us in the office, myself, the assistant clerk, who is also the clerk of the council committees, the assistant registrar of voters, and two full-time clerks. We're fortunate to have a summer intern, who unfortunately is coming out to UMass next week, we're gonna lose him, and three senior volunteers who assist us with genealogy inquiries and general office tasks on a regular basis. And finally, I'm very fortunate that my two immediate predecessors, Kathleen Connolly and Francis McDonald, are both available to us as needed for long-term projects, archiving of council minutes, and Fran also serves as a member of our Board of Registrars of Voters. The handout that Stan mentioned that I provided to you, and there are plenty of copies for anyone who's interested, include the relevant sections of our own Home Rule Charter and also our code of ordinances related to my own position, the organization of our legislative branch of Beverly's government. It reflects the good work of that charter commission that I mentioned in the mid-90s, and the ordinance review committee of the council that I chaired during my six years on that body. Hopefully it will spark some discussion and give you some idea of how we operate and allow you to make use of whatever portions of either document you feel best fit your needs here in Northampton if any. I was asked by your local reporter about a trend toward a local, uh, elected or appointed city clerks, and I will tell you that I told him that if there's a trend, the reality is that each, commit, each community among the 50 city clerks that, that serve has its own unique structure, its own unique relationship between the clerk, the legislative body, and the city's executive. Hmm. And your charge in the end is to take from my comments tonight your own discussions, the wishes expressed by your residents, and the political realities we all operate in, and recommend for adoption the best arrangement for Northampton that you can develop along with all your other recommendations. I wish you all the very best in these efforts and would be pleased to answer any questions you may have of me in the time allotted to me on your agenda. I know you have a long night. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. All right, questions? <coughs> Wes, uh, can you speak to uh, when was the change was made in the, in the mid-90s from yes. elected city clerk? No, the clerk, uh, the clerk historically had been, the, cha the terms are interchangeable even in the charter that you have a copy of, elected versus appointed, but it was done by the Board of Aldermen previously, and now the City Council. 
and I think the idea was that this, the council would have a full-time employee of theirs in City Hall that was, um, I'm considered a non-union management employee of the city. So I'm a department head, but I don't work for the mayor. Um, and the idea was that um, because of the part of my job that is the clerk of the council, along with the other things that, that Pam does and I do in my office, um, that, part of the, that part of the job would have a full-time representative of the council sitting in City Hall and operating along with everyone else. Um, it, it, it's an interesting relationship because I, in the same way that I described Jerry Perry, the budget analyst, having a good working relationship with the mayor and staff, it, it's the same for me. Uh, we, we, we may have different agendas, we may serve different masters, but the objective at the end of the day is to have something that works best for the city, um, whether it's an idea that comes from the council or the mayor. And, and because of that, part of my job that is clerk of the council, that's a, a fair amount of what I spend my time on along with the other things that go on in the office. I'm ultimately responsible for all of those things, but among the people in the office, we divide up responsibilities and pretty much everybody's cross-trained to do everything, but people tend to focus on one area or another depending on their experience and expertise. In your, in your work with the uh, Massachusetts uh, City Clerks Association, there are still a handful of clerks who are elected. So I think it's f five out of the yeah. 50, something like that. What would, uh, what would they say as an argument for maintaining an elected clerk? I, you know, Stan, I think, I think the simple answer is most of us, if we spent time in the same community, either as a resident or an elected official or a city employee, um, we're most comfortable with what we're used to. And unless there's some significant change in the community, like happened in Beverly leading up to that charter change in 96, where it, it was just unwieldy to expect the old Board of Aldermen, former Board of Aldermen, to run the city. They, they were, as the city council is now, uh, an elected group of part-time politicians. Most all of them had day jobs or might have been retired, but they weren't necessarily um, they weren't necessarily elected uh, into a position that had, that had that amount of authority. And so it was a big change, but it was one that Beverly felt needed to happen to have to go from that arrangement to a strong strong mayor form of government similar to what you have here. Uh, running local government today is certainly much more complex and the, the responsibilities of the job are, are probably best focused on an executive um, and the legislative branch provides that that function as well. Al, um, how many councilors are there? We have nine. Uh, there are six wards and three at large and one of the quirks I was talking to Sam earlier, um, the three at-large councilors run citywide, and the one of them who gets the most votes in the election this November will become the city council president for the two-year term. And the logic of that, if I could just explain, is that if anything happens to the mayor, council president becomes acting mayor, and the, th the thought of the commission was it should be somebody that ran citywide as opposed to a ward councilor, and that got the most votes. It's it's not that way in Salem or Peabody. Salem elects their council president every year. Peabody does the same and they historically give it to the least senior counselor. I, I don't understand the logic of that. So how do you deal with having nine bosses? <laughs> um, I, I say to anyone who asks that I do have nine bosses, but it's a practical matter and I, I'm answerable to all of them. I'm elected to a two year term every two years by charter, but um, the council president typically is the one that I have the most dealings with, sets the agenda, uh, works on, um, council president uh, appoints the committee chairs, the members of the committee, um, pretty much sets the agenda, and, and uh, uh, most, on council business, that's the person that I deal with most frequently, but 
one of the counselors called me this morning on the way out here and wanted to it wanted to get a copy of the planning board's rules of operation because there's a big planning board meeting tonight that he was going to attend. So I deferred it to the assistant who's covering the office today in my absence and, and did that. So I, any one of the nine can can get in touch with me. And do you take direction from any of the nine? So I mean, making a copy of uh, rules and regulations, that's yeah. anybody could share that from a, from a clerk. But yeah. I'm just talking about you know, direction as a supervisor. Sure. Um, I, I will say that um, I'm fortunate that in, in most cases um, it doesn't come to that. They typically will at least have a discussion with the council president if it's something like that. And they'll say to me, you know, I talked to Paul and he wanted me to call you and ask you to do this. And it's a courtesy among the nine. It doesn't always work perfectly mm -hmm. with nine individuals, but as a practical matter, I think it, it it works pretty well. It's nine different personalities, and they're all the the requirements of each one are different. But it's it's nine. I I will say, having run for office before, it's the easiest election I ever ran in because there are only nine voters. Right. Mm -hmm. But have you ever felt that you um, had different signals from different councilors as, as your nine bosses? Um, I, I will say that some are easier to deal with than others, but um, I think the, the assistant clerk and I, because she works as a clerk of committees, um, we can pretty much satisfy whatever they think they need, whether we believe they need it or not. So, Well, of course, you're a former counselor, so you, you have some sense of the workings of, of the body that, that someone else might have. Has there been discussion verbally about um, about the wisdom of having the council appoint the clerk as opposed to the mayoral appointment? Not, not that I'm aware of. I think the feeling of the council generally is that the mayor pretty much gets to do most everything and ultimately controls the budget. So um, my position and the budget analyst position are the only ones that are directly reporting to the council and they're, they're pretty happy to have that stay that way, at least for us. How about the mayor? How does he feel about it? Um, the mayor actually is a former council president, so I think he understands the, the, um, the dynamics of it. I, just as a side note, um, um, part of the reason that I left the council was that I ran for mayor against the incumbent. He, wa he wasn't the incumbent then, he had run once before and lost, but he came in and run and no one else was gonna run, so I, I ran against him and, and was out of office long enough that I was able to apply for this job when it came up and was very ex and encouraged to go for it. Um, I was asked a couple of times when I went to a couple of the clerks meetings by people that knew the politics of Beverly, who's the mayor of Beverly? I said, Mike Cahill. I said, didn't you run against him for mayor? I said, yeah, but I don't, I don't work for him. And I, we've known each other forever. I told a couple of people when I got here today Part of my connection to Northampton was bringing our son and his soccer team out to UMass Amherst for the tournament in June. And Mike uh, Cahill was then a state representative um, and one of the coaches. So I've, I've known him for a long time. We, we, have, a, we have a good working relationship and, and um, I think we have a, a sense of mutual respect. And, and um, it, it, was, it was ironic when he got uh, re-elected to his second term that I had become the clerk, so I got to swear him in. So that made a, that made a, the picture in the, is usually in the paper anyway, the mayor being sworn in, but the, the editor that wrote the caption on the picture had some interesting comments about, you know, former rivals, you know, doing this, so. Uh, Wes, are there any thoughts you keep with us about anything that we should be looking at, particularly in a switch from elected to appointed city clerk? Any, any uh, things that we might not just the, the two of the things that I mentioned. Um, one, one, um, if 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 it's an appointment, election or appointment, just we'll use the word appointment. Um, is it an appointment by the mayor, confirmed by the council, as I guess most department heads are, or is it an appointment or election by the council? Um, 
which given the structure here where the council has its own staff, it's more complicated than it would be for us. And the other thing, and, and the reason I specifically mentioned it, is that that other position that I will tell you is very unique among, um, in local government, certainly in cities, and that's that budget management analyst. Um, that position was created because when the shift was made from the Board of Aldermen to a strong mayor, and the former auditor's position went from the, the Board of Aldermen to the mayor, the feeling among the Charter Commission was that the council should have some independent voice that reported to them that had access to the financial systems, access to department heads, um, but was not a member of the administration that could give them independent um, analysis of financial matters that the administration would bring forward. And I will tell you that in the case of the former person in that job, and certainly with Mr. Perry, who's, who's had 30 years with Department of Revenue, we're, we hit the lottery when we got him because he's, he's not only developed a good reputation with the council in the couple of years that he's been there, but he's, worked, he's developed a good working relationship with the administration, with the finance director, treasurer, with the auditor, with the outside auditors, with the mayor himself, it, to the point where a lot of the financial matters that they bring forward, they kind of back back and forth between the finance director and him before the mayor presents them to the council so that there's there's agreement on behalf of the council and the administration that uh, whatever discussion takes place is done um, in, a, in a more working, in a daily working environment than um, in a long drawn out public hearing where there's a lot of opposition. And, and everything's done in a public meeting, obviously, but um, there, are, uh, there are many different ways to go at financial matters. and, and there's not always agreement between Mr. Perry and the administration on how to do it. We're in the process of building a new police station, for example. The current police station was built in 1928. So you can imagine it's sorely in need of replacement. And, and there, right now, one of the big issues is how do we pay for that? And Jerry and Brian Ailes, the finance director, have had frequent meetings on that matter on, well, you know, you could do this or you could try it this way. And, and that, I live in Beverly, I pay taxes in Beverly. I'm, I'm, I'm happy that, as a resident, I'm happy that that kind of discussion goes forward so that um, hopefully we come, at, we come up with the best solution to something that not being a finance person um, is, is agreed to. So those would be the two things. So who, who makes the appointment and you know, some idea about some independent financial advice to the council however you choose to um, create that. Thank you. So you talked about the complexity of the position, um, but you said that there are political realities that go along with the trend for an elected position. Can you just address those, what you see as the political realities? Uh, well, I think the, the, the biggest example of it would be Framingham that had been a town forever and, and chose for some similar reasons to Beverly to become a city uh, with a totally different form of government. And a, and a, a, a town that, like Plymouth, which is much bigger than Beverly, but it was considered to be a town. Plymouth is even bigger than that, but it's still a town. So the, I think those are the kinds of political realities. And the other thing is that, you know, elected officials, um, the 16 that we have, school committee, mayor, city council, um, are, all have two-year terms. This is an election year. Uh, I mentioned most of them are unopposed, but some are not. A couple of incumbents have challengers. Uh, one ward counselor who's leaving, there's a primary in, in his ward. So the, the, those nine, as, as, as Alan said, those nine bosses of mine uh, today, two of them won't be there in January when I swear them in. Could be three. So that's a different political reality based on who's sitting at the table. So the unique structures, that's what you have to I think so, okay. yeah. yeah. Hmm. Anybody else? Okay, Wes, thanks very much. Appreciate you coming out here and hope you enjoy your day here in my
Thank you. Thank you very much. and I was a city councilor for eight years from Ward 3. And I'm here with Fred, actually. I'm, I'm doing this sort of preface here because um, Fred got a number of us going on thinking about annual reports. Fred has discovered that up until, um, I don't know, 30 years ago or so, we used to publish all the annual reports from all the heads of departments in a book so that they could be looked at by citizens and politicians and whoever wanted to look at them. And when Fred told me about this, I was astonished because we did not have that resource when I was a city councilor. And boy, would it have helped. It would have given me background. I would have figured out exactly what was going on. Um, we would have been able to discuss these things. And so um, I just want to sort of um, support what Fred is going to say. And I think it would have made me a better city councilor. I would have had more information for my, um, uh, for my uh, people and my board. And I would have been also able to say, look, you can go read this, you know, and then, you know, if you have comments on these annual reports from the police and the fire department and whatever, Let's talk about it, and we can take it forward to the city council as a whole. So um, I just want to say that Fred and I have both talked to people about this question of having reports, having them be public, um, having them be in a public place like the library, and um, we keep getting good, um, good response to that. And that might be a small thing to write into our charter and go back to where we were. Maria, you're talking about a, an actual physical bound of, of report that is hard to copy. Um, yes, yes, and Fred can give you more information about that. Does, does anyone sitting here know when the last time we did publish an annual report of that nature? It was 87. 87. 87. 87. 87. 87. Yeah. And, you know, in this day and age, it doesn't have to be published, um, but it could be online, there could be a site, something like that. Um, I'm a little dyslexic, even though I'm a college professor. I like to have things that are hard copy. But um, I think it's mainly the point of having reports, having people annually that we pay large amounts of money to in each um, area, uh, each department. Having that, um, that moment of being accountable, I think that would be very useful. And we'd hear what they needed as well. So. Yeah. Is this different from like what's in the budget? Because there's a like the budget that comes out every year. There's I don't know how we call it. I don't know if it's the same thing, but there's a yeah narrative of what each department does. But to hear it from the head of the department. Yeah, they present it at the budget hearings. Right. Yes, but to have something a little bit more capacious for people to read and more permanent. Um, so that you could go back and look at a little history. I know that would have helped me as a city councilor. Mm -hmm. uh, it would have helped me serve my, my people and my constituents and have a better sense of the whole city. So, but but Maria, just what you're asking for is not necessarily hard copy. You would be satisfied if it were available electronically. As long as I could print it out because I'm a little dyslexic. But, um, but something that would be permanent. I, I think there's some some virtue in, you know, if it were online, at least having somebody print it out and take it to the library, uh, which is basically what we've got. 
But that doesn't have to be necessarily written into the chart. The main thing is getting those annual reports from the different departments, um, a statement that the head of the departments can be held um, accountable to. Thank you. Thanks. Fred? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I guess Maria gave you the short version of it. Uh, this is something I've had in my mind for probably 10 or 20 years. And uh, I've talked to various people about it. I wanted to bring it forward. I never had an opportunity, so you guys look like a captive audience. <laughs> so I thought I'd try you. My name is uh, Fred Zimnock. I live in Ward 3B. I grew up in East Anton about, I grew up in East Anton, but for four years, I attended St. Michael's High School in North Anton. School let out at 1.45 in the afternoon and the Western Mass bus left for East Hampton at 2.30. That left 45 minutes of time to kill. Some of that time was spent in a dimly lit, smoke-filled room on Pleasant Street, which we simply called Bills, where I would run a few racks of balls. Time was also spent at Forbes Library, usually browsing the collection of books and periodicals. One collection of books that caught my eye was a long set of brown covered books in a reference room. They were books published annually from 1888. They ceased publication in 1987. That's about 30 years ago. They were annual reports of the city of Northampton. I would occasionally browse these books and always found them immense amount of data and history of the city fascinating. Each city department had a section in which they summarized their annual efforts with regards to finance, activities, and inventory. I looked at the 1976 annual report to see how the data that was there, the form of the data there, would be helpful today. City Clerk did a report, page 72. In these volumes, the City Clerk posted a number of births, marriages, deaths, dog licenses, fishing and hunting licenses. Several years ago, there was a PAC Public Advisory Committee which held meetings with engineers designing the new Exit 19 exit. The engineers considered 12 designs, each with two options. The last design included a flyover ramp from Damon Road that would allow cars to travel over the intersection of Route 91 travel over the intersection and land on Route 91. Meetings to review the designs were on, went on for some time. I missed one meeting, but Jerry Budger, who kept minutes, sent me a copy of the meeting that I missed. It said that the design basis parameter was that Northampton population would increase 10% over 20 years. This sounded a bit high. Googling and Googling on the web to collect numbers proved the estimate to be high, as I and others expected. When Frank Verbinski, our PAC chair, questioned the engineers, they consulted the PVPC, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, who reconsidered the number and said a more realistic number was 3%. This knocked out eight designs including the flyover ramp. Having annual vital statistics from the city clerk's office available for inspection would have been useful to our PAC and also to the PVPC. Fire Department, page 302. In the annual report, they posted a the number of fire calls by month and type. These included brush fires, dumpster fires, auto fires, wood frame, chimney, oil burner, brick, commercial structure, and miscellaneous. They also listed need needless and false calls. During the Bay Fire Spree in Ward 3 that lasted several years and culminated in an early morning, early morning of December 27, 2010, with a couple dozen fires, these records might have been helpful to understand the situation. There were public meetings later on fires in which the police and fire chief appeared with a representative from the DA's office. When I asked the fire chief about a record of fires, 
He said they rely on the memory of an old timer in the fire department. Given no current record of keep, given no current record keeping on the frequency and type of fires, how do insurance underwriters calculate our insurance premiums? Police Department, page 209. This annual report has extensive lists of arrests by sex and age. This includes drug offenses. When Ms. Angela Fossman ran for city council from Ward 3, she often spoke of the problem of drug use in the high school. Some of her concern may have come from her daughter who was in NHS. I often wondered how prevalent such abuse was among our teenagers. The annual report of drug arrests and drug deaths would have answered these questions. During 1976, when the report was put out, there were 792 motor vehicle accidents with two fatalities, 182 personal injuries, and 613 instances of property damage. Any idea of what happened with vehicle accidents in the city last year? Health Department. The annual report listed the occurrences of communicable diseases by month for residents and non-residents. Today, um, including measles. They also add the number of vaccinations distributed during the year. Would the occurrences of measles and measles vaccinations be of interest to anyone today? Should tick infections now be added to that list? Other departments. Since the cessation of the reports, much has changed. Back then, we had no conservation land. Today, we have more than 20 25% of our land under conservation. Should we also include an annual report on conservation land if we have such a report? What about annual report on climate change? We also have a stormwater enterprise fund. Should this be included? We see stores closing downtown. What about an economic development report? Current practices. The city stopped publishing these reports 30 decades ago. Today, the city does offer information about some of these departments. The fire department only lists service call statistics starting in 2015. And the police department lists their daily runs for the current year, but you don't know what they did. The city has an open checkbook which allows fiscal transparency, but as anyone who has worked professionally will easily recognize, this stream data is raw data. Raw data needs to be processed to, make, to be made sense out of. The annual report, report contains much more information because they contain processed data. Also note that in streaming raw data on a computer, it's impossible to see the data for multiple years. You only see this year, where was 2010? Don't know. Conclusion. These annual book reports that I saw as a high school student were produced when the tools available were the fountain pen, typewriter, hectograph machine, and Smith book printing. It was also a time when high school diplomas were a ticket to a good job. Today, the tools are word processor, thank you Xerox Park, Excel spreadsheet, thanks Dan Bricklin, copy machines, thanks Chester Frank Parker, and self-publishing. Now many employees have a college degree. There will be a capital cost of producing these reports, but after that it's cut and paste. But if you look at these annual reports carefully, you'll notice something very important. The chapters are annual reports by city department heads addressed to his honor, the mayor. So the reader, reader is assured that the department heads are reporting their efforts to the mayor and the mayor has received formal report of their efforts. Are department heads still annually reporting to the mayor? If the reports are still being made, they should be made available in a book, made available to the public. They could easily be collated and printed at Paradise Copy. I know that Paradise Copy publishes town reports. I therefore ask the committee to restore our annual city reports as part of the city charter. As process data, 
about our city. These reports are an invaluable source of information for municipal officials and legislators. They offer us a same view of the city that is unavailable elsewhere. They are a necessary aid to planning for our city's future. The accomplishments listed also provide a source of pride for municipal workers. They provide a historic view of our city for future generations. Finally, it satisfies the city's responsibility to present their annual accomplishments to the mayor and the taxpayer. The city must show the taxpayers what they are getting for their tax dollars. The above, the above discussion refers to only a small portion of the information in the annual reports. So to understand my suggestion, you need to view the Northampton annual report. Existing copies exist in the city clerk's office and in the Hampshire room at Forbes Library. These copies must be used in place. You can't take them home. So it would allow you to examine one of these reports, Forbes Library has volunteered to make a digital copy of the 1976 annual report available on the web. I advise you, if you want to understand what I said, to look at one of these reports. Compare the value of the information in this annual report to what you see on the city's website. And what I've done... is you can take a copy of the URL. Oh, it's real long, but I can't. Let me give her one. Are there any questions? Oh, sure. Oh. Have you, do you look at the budget book each year? So I'm just yeah. curious, like, what, the budget how book much fun? That only tells you what they plan to spend. It also does not tell you what they do spend. I'm just curious, like as I recall, I remember reading and hearing like how many fire calls and like the breakdown of what each call. I never was saw for. that. So where is that located? There's an introduction for each department, and I'm pretty sure they break it down. The stuff I look at for the budget on, on the city website is not there. There's nothing about fire calls. And not only that, it's not just a matter of fire calls, it's what kind of fires. And it's also with the police reports, it's not only how many arrests were made, but what kind of arrests, drug arrests. For example, there's this uh, gentleman, Matlock, who's suing the city, and he says there's lack of police supervision for disorderly conduct. If you had that report, you could see the arrests for disorderly conduct for the last 10 years. Is it going up? Is it going down? Look at the report and see what you think. It's red. Your name is red. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Do you have a sense of why these reports were stopped? I can only guess, but I think what happened is Smith Volk was printing them and Smith Volk stopped printing them. And, you know, it's cost the money to have them print, printed. In fact, I, 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 I can't imagine what it cost them to make those reports because, like I said, they were done with a fountain pen, with a typewriter, there was no Excel spreadsheet, uh, how did you make tabular data, there was no Microsoft Word that we could make a table in. It was a hell of a lot of work. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, now with a spreadsheet, word processor, uh, hey, it's, it's a piece of cake. In fact, it, I would hope, I would hope that information is out there, and I would hope, again, that the mayor is getting those annual reports. Right. Well, I, I certainly appreciate that you're asking these questions. Um, I spent 10 years of providing this kind of information to the city manager, and my frustration was I didn't think anyone was looking at them outside of the city manager. Well, I mean, look, yeah. Okay. Um, now, between open governments and requirements for transparency and the filing that cities have to do to DOR and the state, I'm very confident that what you're asking for is available in various places. For example, I mean, 
when I had to fill, when I had to submit a budget, I had to annually submit not only the dollar request, which in my case was just several hundred thousand dollars because I had to stay out of ten, but I always had I always had to supply a narrative which talked about goals, accomplishments, and then statistics, and so. All the data that you're asking for is very important. It used to astound me how few people seemed interested in the amount of work that I and the other department heads did to provide it. But it's there. You know, where, it, where it reposes is maybe the question. Okay? But a lot, you know, I would, you know, I would encourage you to find out in to the extent that it's relevant to what our mission is, we can be helpful. But between an annual budget process and then the annual audit, which is called the CAFRA, have you ever seen the CAFRA report? I don't know. Well, the CAFRA is the annual audit that a municipality has to have done. It's submitted to the state and it's submitted to the, the legislative body. And in the CAFRA, is the 10 years of financial information that you asked for that corresponds to production. So, you, you know, you, you want to, and it's a document, right? And it's also available digitally. So, you know, things may not be as bad as you might think. It's, it's a question of where the stuff reposes and how to get it to you most convenient. Well, I mean, that's the problem. In the past, there was no problem about digging. There was no problem. You know, when this issue came up, the population increasing 10% for for, uh, exit, for Northampton to build exit 19, I don't want to tell you how much time I spent on a computer trying to get the numbers. And if these were available in book form at the library, you just go down and look at them. You don't have to start a research pro project to, to do all this stuff. It shouldn't be for the taxpayer to have to do a research project to find this information. It should be published in one place. Now, it can be a book. It's cheap enough to do books nowadays. Or it could be a, a, a document on the web. But I, I take a look at the annual report. See what you think. I think the public should have that information. It should be easy to find. It should be such that you can see the years and, you know, and they go by. Let, let me just tell you one, one thing. I don't, you, you know this see a lot better than I do. I've just been here for a couple of years. But I happen to know that this is a triple A rated city with standard pools. The city cannot get that rating without the data that you that you're asking about being available. That's it, fine, but I think, I think the it's public there. should see it. I think it's worthwhile and it's necessary, but it's up to you guys. If you want to do something, fine. If you don't, well, I appreciate it. I appreciate it bringing it to our attention. I think what you're saying is the ease which people who are citizens can find this material, and it's easier to find it when it's in one place. Okay. Uh, thanks, Lynn. Uh, Lynn, can you, can you just explain what um, reports the department has to deliver to the mayor each year? Sure, I'm, I'm actually looking also at the link that Greg provided. Um, I'm not familiar with these annual reports, um, but I'm looking at it here and it looks awfully similar to the city budget that is done annually. So every year, mayor um, or the charter has a budget forecast or outlook where he calls together the elected bodies in January and then um, meets with every single department head as they make a budget presentation to him. And then the mayor and the finance director um, collaborate all of that, collaborate on all of that with department heads. They submit a narrative that summarizes what the prior fiscal year was and looking forward. It also outlines the mission of the department. Um, last year's budget was 252 pages long. NBS and Smithville. And then City Council, it's sent to City Council in May. They refer it to committee. They call, they choose what departments they want to hear from. And then they hold meetings with them, public meetings, public hearings. And then they vote on it. 
it looks awfully similar to the annual report. I mean, obviously, each administration is going to put their own uh, look on it and ask for what they think is relevant information. Um, but you know, the breakdown of arrests is in there. Um, certain fire call information is in there. And where would this um, be available? It's uh, on the city website. At least the last six fiscal years that Mayor Narquitz has, pre has uh, prepared a budget. Um, prior to that, there were budgets available online, but they weren't in an easy to understand format. This is one comprehensive document. And let's see, there's copies that Lily Forbes each city councilor gets a copy, a copy of the city clerk's office, and then the electronic version. Okay, so there are hard copies in the library. Yes. Uh, yes, Maria. I, I want to say um, I appreciate your being able to tell us where we might find this stuff. Um, I'm a relatively bright person. I teach at the University of Massachusetts. I do research. I couldn't possibly get the information that I would need going through all those steps that you're talking about. Um, and as a city councilor, I didn't just want to know about the budget. I did want to know how many, you know, how much theft there was in the city. I did want to know things pertaining to children and school things that went beyond money. I would have appreciated the availability of all that stuff in print in one place. Thank you. Uh, Sue? I'm sorry, I didn't prepare a really big one. I just heard about this meeting a couple hours ago. So um, I kind of agree with them, actually. I like granularity. And I know exactly what you're saying, that you can't figure out how much water we sell to Coca-Cola as a percent of the water that we have in Northampton. You know, just real basic data like that. So. But I'm not here to talk about that. Um, I was born here, and I've never lived here until very recently. I grew up outside of Boston. And um, I'm going to quote somebody who is no longer with us, Anne Creasine Wilson. She was a, a city clerk extraordinaire out of Boston and helped a lot of people through sort of the city clerk process um, over the last 50 years. And she told me one time, um, and this is consistent with what Wes said, that the treasurer and the city clerk are really important in a city or town, and that's why the state requires them. I would have liked to see the treasurer stay elected, but in the absence of that, the city clerk is often the next in line after the mayor in a lot of charters. And the reason they did that is because you have the executive branch, so CEO, you have city council, legislative, and the city clerk is actually the referee. I'm not going to pay him because I was just in there bothering her the other day. But they, they referee a lot. They say the elections were fair, that the papers were turned in on time, that the signatures matched, that somebody turned in a lawsuit and it was actually on this date, and I forget how many days you have. I mean, there's a, there's a myriad of rules that go on, and it's really the check and balance on the government and I, I thought I'd just run down here. I actually was supposed to be somewhere else and just say that out loud because Anne Creason Wilson told me that um, in many conversations. She said that there were lots of times when somebody said something was posted and they hadn't, they predated the time stamp in some of the cities and towns she worked with so that they could cover the open meeting law. So the city clerk is really, really important and I understand that the concern that if you have a city clerk that's turning over a lot, that you don't have the knowledge and all that, but a good city clerk will be reelected again and again. And it puts them sort of out from under the political adventure of either the council or the, or the CEO. And that balance of power is really important to me. It's one of those things that you can't repair when you change it, that you can't really go back to that. So I think that's basically um, everything I want to say. You know, I understand the permanence issue and getting reelected and all that, but it's a really important function, and it's sort of the last one. And so I hope you think really long and hard before you make it an appointed um, position. And I don't know what your position is on this, so I apologize. But um, I just feel really strongly about it. 
I'm conservative, I'm a Republican, so you may want to just dismiss what I'm saying. But I really believe in the balance of power, and that's why those cities and towns did that. You know, it's really important to really good. Um, and, and putting the data out so that people can find what they look for is good too. But that's, I just want to make sure you heard that point. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, oh, sorry, Mom. No, 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 that's okay. Um, I appreciate your points around, particularly the neutrality and the checks and balances, but the piece that I have a question around really comes down to um, the sort of logical conflation of a good person will be elected again and again. I'm just not sure that bears out. You just scared me when you say that. Um, I think we have seen that in most, actually, some of our most recent elections, although politically we may disagree right there. But good I don't, we don't actually disagree oh on that. Oh, thank God. One. But, you know, you almost have to have faith that the system works, even if it fails once in a while. Because the opposite of that, is is not having the check and balance. I mean, it's 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 basically assuming that we don't need the yin and the yang. Mm -hmm. And I'm just arguing that the yin and the yang eventually, it, it shows the light of day. It shows that timestamps weren't in time, or it shows that lawsuits are being dismissed without being. And I think that's the rule of the city clerk, and that's why they're so high up there. Mm -hmm. And like I said, in many places, if you know the mayor were to go, it's actually the city clerk that. Than a legislative branch mm -hmm. because they carry the they carry the city or town until there's an election. But so I didn't mean to get into politics. I no, apologize. No, no, no. Uh, but I, I understand exactly what you just said. It's like yeah, I get it. It's scary mm -hmm. when you get somebody that's not good. But then you get you know you get to change that in a few years. Thank you. Other questions? Thanks. Thank you. Did anyone come in uh, later who didn't sign to speak? Who wants to speak? It's sort of it's two things. One is this actual report that we had outside consultants do, but more it's a general effort that we're doing as far far beyond the board. So just in terms of a quick setting the stage. So my department is planning a sustainability. Sustainability, which is typically defined, what we define it is um, environment, economy, and equity. And so equity is sort of one of our core principles that we deal with. And there's, there's, and I, I know we're talking about underrepresented members, but I want you to sort of understand how we think about equity generally. So we think about four components of equity, um, and they're, they're all really important to us. The one that probably gets the most attention is distributional equity. Who gets the goodies and who gets the baddies? Um, and so we spend a lot of effort on that, whether it's Community Preservation Act, exempting the first amount of property tax from CPA, 
people with less expensive homes are more sensitive to we have $120,000 this year from community on block grant to put in wheelchair curb cut ramps. And the first test we did for that is we mapped environmental justice areas, which is a synonym for low income and minority areas. And we, we prioritized wheelchair ramps within those areas. And so we do that routinely every single open, we, we do this for open space. So we routinely look at, for years we were looking at buying open space so that we were sharing the goodies around the city. Um, in our last open space plan, we said, well, look, we're doing this, if you look at the map, it looks great, except that some of them are fake. So River Run is 50 feet from one of our largest conservation areas, but you can't get there. Um, you know, it's poison ivy, steep slopes. And so that, that distributional equity has been a, a big focus. Then intergenerational equity, and a way to look at it is sort of think about environmental issues. So I'm going to be dead, frankly, before climate change has a big effect, but I don't really want to steal from my daughter or my grandkids. And so intergenerational equity is thinking about future generations so we don't do those resources now. Um, and structural equity, this is sort of, you know, often hear the term um, institutional racism, and, and we distinguish institutional racism from racism in the sense of, you know, nobody says they're racist, but the example I'll often give is neighborhoods know to come to public meetings, to come to city council, to lobby for sidewalks. River Run, lower income, a lot of people are first generation Americans, didn't come to public hearings and didn't get sidewalks. And I don't think it was ever a decision by DPW or, or city council or God forbid my department to leave out River Run, but the effect was they did not work the system and they didn't. And so then the fourth one, which is what we're focusing on a lot, I think, here is this procedural equity. How do we know we get people involved? So if you look at the, our climate change plan, which we're working on now, we did an inventory. You know, we reached out to a few hundred people, and we measured what percentage of Latino, Hispanic communities we get, what percentage of African American communities we get. And frankly, we we're underrepresenting those communities, but at least we're sort of trying to shine a light on this. We know we're doing it. We spend a lot of effort on doing that, so a lot of our efforts have been in this distributional area. Easier, frankly, in Northampton, because our minority populations are so small, but nonetheless, they, we're, they're underrepresented across the board on, on public meetings uh, and everything else. And, and it's almost, we know we run the risk of tokenizing them. We, we have a few volunteers who are, who are willing to step forward, and so we hit them up for every single board we can get it. And, and again, it's not for lack of trying, and, the mayor's office and city council, it's, it's a difficult population because they tend to be more renters, 45% of our population is renters, but a large majority of our Latino population is renters. Um, and so we just, we know that's a challenge in the process. And so that's sort of been the effort that we've done, re-energizing democracy. It was sort of a funny story, it was about the walk bike plan, you know, pedestrian combinations. And we knew we went to this plan, we applied for a bunch of grants, Figure maybe one would come through and two would come through. On, two came through so we had more money than we needed. Um, so we said, great, we want to, we, we know we want to direct an outreach to get low income and minority neighbors involved in the process. Let's use this money for this outside consultant people we see in this case to help us think about some of these things. Um, and we can go into weeds in the plan, but there's really three things that, that we've used over and over again. This is from the literature around the country that, that we know works. Um, and so we try to really do this as much as possible. The first and most important thing from our standpoint is we can't expect people to come to our meetings. We need to go to their meetings. Um, and so we do a lot of effort for doing that. It's hard. One of the things that's a challenge in a small community is a lot of people don't really have meetings that we can attend. You know, it's not big groups. You know, we, we used to work with Casa Latina. And at one point they turned to us and said, you know, you can't really expect us to represent every Latina right. and, and Hispanic neighborhood in the entire city. That was the one group we had that, that did it. Um, and we know that we, when we were doing some uh, bike and pet planning in Jackson Street, we worked with these small families with power. That was our biggest single representation in that neighborhood because we went to them. Um, and so we do that a lot. There is a disadvantage which we have not found a good solution to, which is when we go to people, which is the way it works, then the rest of the community doesn't hear the conversation. In an ideal world, we have a big meeting, everyone's there and we hear everybody else. And we try that, we bring food, we do babysitting, none of which has frankly been very successful. We provide babysitting, it's overwhelmingly middle class people who don't need it, who use it. Um, 
we've done some of these again with Casa Latina. They did a day where everyone brought food, and it was a big potluck. And while they were eating, we sort of did focus groups. That was first. So we sort of know how to do it. It's both resource intensive, which is a challenge, um, and doesn't necessarily get that at all conversation. So that, that's one way that's by far the single most important way. The second way that's really important, and this works when we get some representation on our boards, is getting people in the communities we're trying to target to do the outreach. I don't care how much advertising, direct mail we do, email lists we do, you know, my office alone is 1,400 people, you know, 1,400 people on our listserv, our planner's listserv, we have the family size, we're getting the big man in the city, the mayor has a much larger social media presence. But nothing works like somebody you know and trust in you calling you up and saying, let's go to that meeting. So we try to you know, plant those seeds and get people out, again, with limited success. Some groups are easier. I mean, um, older populations, I guess that's me now, I thought he's saying that, who are underrepresented in some communities are definitely not underrepresented in Northampton. Um, younger people are not so much. Bill Dwight gives a lot of credit for the Youth Commission. Um, and so we have a pretty well represented uh, uh, younger people. Uh, again, it's particularly the Hispanic uh, Latinx community that we, we underrepresent, and it's the renters that we underrepresent. So trying to deal with those. So, and, it, and, it's a, and the reason I set the stage is it goes back to distributional equity because you, you can't separate them. So, for example, we're doing a lot of effort. My department, of Central Services, and trying to increase energy efficiency in city buildings uh, and, and community buildings. But 45% of our population is renters, and there's very little incentive for a renter to make their building more energy efficient because they may not be there. And there's very little uh, incentives for a landlord to make it more efficient because they're not paying the rent. And so we play with things as a crowdsourcing program out of uh, Indianapolis um, where people report what their electric bill is and their gas bill. And we, we play with using that as a way to sort of monetize the difference. Right? So if, if my apartment is really expensive rent, and I know that up front, information is power, then maybe we'll make decisions. So, so we're trying to connect the two together, but, but it's still a challenge. Um, and then the third one that's very controversial in some communities is we have paid stipends for people to take part in focus groups. Um, that, you know, for a lot of middle class people, they can afford two hours of their time for people who are working two jobs or three jobs and can't afford to do it. Mm -hmm. It's controversial because you're asking people to take part in government when we think it's a, an obligation. Um, and it's controversial because if you're paying some people in a room and not other people, it's, it's difficult. So we've done it only in specific cases where it makes sense. So we funded, somebody else ran this, but we funded a, um, uh, we're still funding a food equity process. And it's made up of both advocates who don't get paid and people from food insecure homes and people from food insecure homes do get a stipend that's out there. So for narrow focus groups, to me it makes a lot of sense. We're probably not going to do it for public meetings other than indirectly by bringing coffee or that kind of thing. So, so we're trying to work on, on all of those areas. Um, and as I said, for the most recent effort, just sort of shining a light on this is really important. We think it's the best way to, you know, to, to build that culture. I can ramble on, but here probably be more direct out of what's ever useful for you. Yeah. How do you find people for focus groups? Mm -hmm. So you know we're all, we recently yeah. Right. So there's two answers. One is whoever we can get to show up, but we're always this is sensitive. So I, I, I yeah. said it, yeah. but, for how you said housing. Yeah. 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 So there's two ways to get it. People, you, know, you can get to show up, represent a certain constituency. But we are looking, when possible, for key opinion leaders, people who other people listen to and respect. Um, so this guy, Edward Casale, Sal Travis Pence, the name, who we hired uh, in one of the contracts that we were doing for a health and built environment. He's now in the housing partnership. He's one of these great, he, he came before the planning board in the Nations. He's almost too great because everybody keeps trying to grab him. Um, but, so the, but he represents a certain position. People listen to him, he listens to other people. I mean, yeah. I'm an introvert, so I'm not, nothing against introverts. But an introvert who doesn't talk to anybody is less useful than us mm -hmm. to somebody who works the room. So we're, we're looking when we can for those kinds of people. Asking around is really the best way to do it. You know, one of the problems, particularly for new Americans, we're, we've been trying to do work at River Run in particular, trying to get community gardens, trying to get access. Mm -hmm. And one of the problems we have at River Run is there's a language barrier, not just between us and people at River Run, but 
between different New Americans who live up River Run, and I could there aren't there are a few key opinion leaders, but not a lot. So mm -hmm. with great difficulty, I guess mm -hmm. is the short answer. Again, easier when there's clear groups. So for the Food Equity Council, Real Food Northampton, Casa Latino, when they had a staff presence, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know the sort of groups that have that are formalized are easy. The ones with community are harder. Do you, I, this probably probably isn't something you know the answer to. But I'm curious. Do you have a sense of how many undocumented immigrants are you living in? I don't. It's a good question. I don't. Um, I know many work here, but those I meet often live in other communities. Yeah, I, I don't know the answer. I mean, 10 years ago, by far, the biggest members of Hispanic communities were Puerto Rico, so that wasn't an issue, right? They're all legal. Now we're seeing a much greater population of Central, Central America. Central America. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of undocumented, but I don't have a sense. It may be other people in the community do. I'm not someone who works directly with social services. Mm -hmm. um, and I haven't been involved with the refugee populations. Um, thank you so much for coming, and I have like 8,000 questions <laughs> for you, and I wonder, I know your time is extremely valuable, but I wonder if you would also potentially be available offline to talk about some of these um, yep. specific some of the work right Absolutely. Right. taking everybody's time. But, um, just thinking about the Re-Energizing Democracy Report, the recommendations that were made were, in general, for the city at large, and I hear from you that you guys um, and your department have really done a fabulous job sort of instituting the recommendations um, within your department. You said, and I just want to make sure I really heard you, you know, we don't expect people to come to our meetings, we make ourselves available, we go to meetings, um, we, um, you know, uh, use sort of influencers in the community to make calls, etc., cetera, uh, to do outreach, and um, we pay stipends, which I really I am for because I really see that as the definition of equity. Um, and, and making and that is why we make some funds available to some people and some funds not available to other people. Um, because it's not about equality, that's it's not equity. Um, but in terms of recommendations for the city, do you have a sense whether um, these recommendations were actually implemented? And if so, how do you track whether they have decreased barriers or not? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I want to be clear, because I don't want to toot my horn too much. You yeah. know, again, when we've looked at our successes, our successes are not as good as we'd like. I think it's, yeah. it's paying attention is the most important thing to, to put in the conversations out there. Um, so I don't really know the answer. Let me. This isn't a direct answer, but it's one, one thing I left out that maybe helps a little bit. The area where we're most, most successful, which I think is most important, is the big picture plan. That affects every department. Even my office is the one who's charged with doing planning. It affects a lot of departments. We work with central services, and we work with uh, Parks and Recreation, DPW, and, and Senior Center. And so the outreach we do for our big plans, we walk by, you know, um, that's where all those things I said I think are success and we're doing a good job of getting. The area which we still grapple with is individual projects. So there's been a lot of research recently that's been published in the last year, actually, about who shows up to, for a project in that neighborhood. And it's overwhelmingly middle class property owners, which is understandable. But it is, and we've certainly seen this in Northampton, the people who show up at our big picture meetings tend to be more aggressive for affordable housing. It's certainly a good example. They want more fat housing. They want more white block and biking activities, etc. The people who show up when a housing project is proposed in their neighborhood are the people who own homes nearby, but then we want them in the neighborhood. We absolutely want them in the neighborhood, but we want to get those other voices as well. And so, I know this almost sounds anti-democratic, but one of the things we've done is we used to say, if we're doing a plan, let's hold 20 meetings, because that's great. And then we started, this is what we could measure, we started seeing Someone come to 10 different meetings, say the same thing 10 times, and thought that their vote should count 10 times. Mm -hmm. And someone who was struggling and came once would only come to one meeting, mm -hmm. and, and other people thought their voice shouldn't count. So at that level, we sort of do track who comes to the meeting. People are obviously self-identifying or looking, you know, so it's not a perfect thing. Um, so I think, and, and that affects a lot of different departments. So I think that we're doing well at the individual project, right? You know, I love the fact that City Council opens the meeting with public comment. But it's not representative of the community as a whole. Mm -hmm. And I, I, don't, I don't have a good answer for that. How do we deal with How do we encourage people to come to meetings, which are really important, but not send the wrong message to a decision makers? I, I, I'm not sure where to go with that. I didn't really answer your question directly. Yes. 
Well, there, I mean, I'm thinking about the, as I think about the recommendations in the report, sort of, you know, get to know one another events, things like that, um, screen investments to assess how funding is impacting marginalized populations. I'm just wondering where, where those recommendations sit now. I mean, was there funding that was made available? Are yeah. these things happening? No, yeah, I mean, it, it wasn't done as an action plan they made up. It was okay. to give us ideas for going forward. Got it. It's had influence, I think, in a lot of ways. So we're going through, this is deep in the weeds, but something mm -hmm. about community choice aggregation, where the city would become the default provider for electricity. You could stick with natural or anybody else, but we'd be the default provider. And we're doing this primarily by creating energy sources. But it certainly doesn't escape us from being aware that upper middle class people, middle class people, love this sort of program. I think it's great that we're creating energy, and people who an extra dollar a month could be a big cost don't necessarily like doing that. And so we're trying to sort of use those lessons again as part of the conversation. You know, we, we say we put people first, we say, we, it's almost like climate change is an example. We're trying not to say climate change and social equity. We're trying to say they need to be tied together forever. Um, and I think that lesson's going across different departments. So if you go to health department, for example, they would talk about who goes to a cooling shelter. Um, and if you go to the police department and the fire department, they know exactly who they have to evacuate from the meadows when there's a flood, which populations have access to cars, and which populations don't. So I think we've been successful, and again, I'm not claiming the credit for this, but I think as a city we've been successful at raising the profile, but know that that specific list of things they have, as far as I know, isn't anybody's action plan. Before I ask another question, are there other questions? I mean, I think the one central question that I have is how should, you know, your recommendations, your thoughts, if you have any, on how we might be thinking about the equity piece as it relates to the charter review. Because we are, of course, on a limited time frame. Things needed to, things need to happen yesterday, et cetera. Um, if you look around the room, many of us, like many of the sort of dynamics and demographics that you have also come across with are white presenting. Um, and we have this small group um, that we have labeled underrepresented in community subcommittees. We identify as white. We would like to have more representation. We would like to do all of the best practices yeah. that you are mentioning. You're struggling with all the same things. And we have maybe combined about five hours on top of this a week to potentially do that level of outreach. We don't speak Spanish. Um, we don't want to tokenize. Um, we're not sure what funds we might be able to allocate towards making things more transparent, making things more accessible, et cetera. So part of this is a question of scope and scale. Um, and you know, I don't know how much you have already reviewed the charter you know, yourself, not very much, but perhaps you might be able to suggest, and maybe we can continue the conversation, how we should be thinking about this, um, and how you know, we might be able to sort of apply some of the lessons that you learned along the way from re-energizing democracy to the scope of this work? I, mean, I, I can certainly recommend policy things and actions, some which are in here, some are elsewhere. I, I'm not, and I think the charter is really important, but I don't think the charter wants to get that deep in the weeds for doing it. So I'm not sure the things that I would think are really important are necessarily charter type issues. Sure. You know, I would love, for example, the capital improvements program. You know, the mayor asked some specific questions. What's the effect on, uh, you know, maintenance, on future staffing, and that kind of thing? It would be a great opportunity to think about for every investment, who's the winner and who's the loser mm -hmm. in the process. I don't think that's a charter mm -hmm. type issue. So I can give you policy things, but nothing offhand comes for, for you know, charter issues. I mean, certainly, who votes? I mean, you know, you're talking about the age of voters. So who votes? Who voting places are? In the community, you know, I, I, I drive my voting place is not a deal, but it's a, it's a big deal for some communities. But again, I don't think you probably go that deep in the weeds. But again, in terms of the district, and I don't, you know, need to argue for our sake, but in terms of the distribution of resources, if we're making recommendations, we are a body that is making recommendations, and we are the only people in the room. I mean, isn't there sort of a level of making sure this this body in and of itself is? as participatory and inclusive as possible so that we are getting all the ways possible to sort of inform the recommendations we are making. Right. And, and that, you know, it's interesting, 
in, let me try sustainability for a second, it's, it's related. There's different philosophies different cities have. One is you should have a, a, a sustainability department where everything's centralized. You know, right now we do recycling at DPW, we do energy and central services, we do land use and transportation in my department. I've never been an advocate for that because it almost lets the other departments off the hook. It says they're the ones who do that. And so, to me, the important thing for, you know, for involving the community is it just needs to be a charge that every department has when they're doing work to think about who, who makes the loses in the process. Again, it's an approach as opposed to a charge. Let me think about it more and then turn it back to you. Other, other questions? City right now is almost finalizing. It's after public comment now a fair housing plan, and right. certainly part of fair housing is how we're reaching other communities, um, and that's everything from homeless to you know Latino communities. That, so the same sort of where's their discrimination? So the fair housing plan is part of that. We do again. The mayor's office does a consolidated plan that takes every five years for HUD, which is a big picture how we spend block. We get about eight hundred thousand dollars a year block grant. How are we spending those funds? The city has funded directly three different homeless shelters in town, which is more than, than most communities, and indirectly another two homeless shelters. Um, so we have plenty of various states in all five transitional housing or homeless shelters in the city. Um, so it's been a major commitment through the last three mayors. Uh, this one certainly very strong. Okay. Let, me, let me just say, sort of the only thing I was thinking about um, our little subcommittee is going to be sort of sharing um, a report, an informal report um, after this on the agenda in terms of you know, right. some goals um, that we can think about and maybe if yeah if you have the time great I was I would love your feedback on whether you think that could be meaningful um, because I do I think our idea you know particularly with your recommendation of um, sharing knowledge and sharing information. So one of our things is, you know, can we at least be translating in Spanish? Um, can we at least be sharing agenda minutes, et cetera? Can we be posting them, where to post them, et cetera? If that's all that we can do in the five hours we have, then, you know, that's something, et cetera. Um, but I do still feel that as we're sort of going over and making recommendations around things like, you know, access to information or compensation or appointments, et cetera, that there are voices that we aren't hearing from. And I really do see that as an equity issue. Right. Um, and I see that as separate from going into the weeds with specific policy things. I just see it as a general, we should have as many voices and be as inclusive as possible to make sure that 
whatever we're rec recommending in terms of compensation, whatever we're, we're recommending in terms of appointments reflects a wide diversity of opinions. I would think that you know you would agree with that piece. Yes. Okay, that's great. Thanks. Thank you. All right, so with that, we will hear from the <laughs> subcommittee. Mainly we were just, it was just um, Patty and I, mainly we were, you know, reflecting on, you know, just we have shared before. You know, this is our, how do we make this apply, the limited amount of time that we have, uh, both in terms of, you know, time, money, and people power, et cetera. So identifying the goals of what the subcommittee should be was our first, um, you know, priority. And we, we think, and just in terms of the inclusion piece, what we think, that we um, would like to be able to do is translate the documents that we, um, you know, that are currently are currently related to the business of the charter review, um, perhaps in Spanish. And I know Lynn um, maybe can speak to the translation services that could potentially be available. We wondered about the possibility of translating the minutes into Spanish, um, and even maybe the larger goal of translating the charter itself. And it may already be, but um, translated um, into Spanish. And then what we can do, um, Patty and I, is, you know, get to those places um, in Northampton and disseminate the information, disseminate agenda. Um, we came up with the Pioneer Valley Worker Center, the Housing Authority, Northampton Young Professionals, but if other people have some other ideas in terms of where we can be sharing this information or other ways in which we can do um, outreach certainly appreciate that. There was um, some discussion of growth in Northampton. You know, we would be happy to potentially do some tabling. Maybe um, we can discuss as a group briefly what kind of information we would like to have available. Maybe it's just the charter um, that we have available in different languages, etc. But if there are other ideas, this might be um, a good point to discuss here. Um, but I think in reality, I'm not sure what, what else we can do given the limitations that we have, uh, but we are certainly open to suggestions. Um, with that, you know, I guess I'm sort of curious to hear um, input from Lynn around uh, translation services, maybe even childcare. Um, but I do, you know, Wayne, hear sort of your point around how you know, beneficial that might be. You know, as a resource, do we want to use those resources for something that? You know, may or may not be taken advantage of. Sure. So, now that I have a little bit more of a definition on what you would want to translate, I can reach out to UMass Translation Services and get an estimate on what it would cost to at least translate the charter, um, and then we could go from there. Uh, uh, regarding child care, I did reach out to Wayne of this and he pretty much provided the same information to me that he gave to you all tonight um, and I can certainly share it I have it in a document so I can share it via Annie um, and then just to only offer in very very small scale um, having attended numerous PTO meetings and offering child care at every single one of those meetings it has absolutely done nothing to me any turnout, any new faces at any of those items. So, mm -hmm. um, and it seems like that carries through with what we were saying as well. Um, that it just it, it didn't really do anything to bring new people to the table, um, and it happened to continue to go. Uh, and then just I was having trouble wrapping my mind around how childcare. Are we talking about it just to? at these meetings, mm -hmm. or are we talking about it? I don't know how you would write that into the charter. I don't know how you would administer something like that. Like, would someone Corey and Sorry, these people that were watching other people's children at a meeting. Like, my mind went crazy with all the possibilities on this and who would be responsible for it and how a request would be made. Um, so I didn't have as much of a focus on that as I did on the translation and interpretation services. But now that I know at least that piece, I can get a quote from UMass Translation and at least talk about the charter. You know, I wonder. I wonder about the idea of, and I don't 
I, so I guess the one question I have is, what what funding could potentially be available besides the translation services? I mean, I wonder if funding could be made available to um, you know essentially pay folks for their wisdom and um, recommendations that they might be able to provide if they took a look at the charter and was able to provide you know recommendations around input you know or whatever else that we're looking for because it seems like the end goal of this is to make sure that on some level the charter is being vetted um, by people that aren't necessarily um, representing the same class, the same gender, the same racial background, etc. So could you know resources be made available on a stipend basis to be able to pay people for their time to review the charter, etc., and be able to provide input? Question. I'm just yeah throwing it out. I mean, right now the meetings are open, right? And we expect people to come, and we have a certain number of people who do come. But what if we pay people to be available to review the charter, et cetera, um, for their time to be able to make these recommendations, et cetera, sort of as consultants? So I guess the question then is, what kind of money realistically would be available? We have no budget as a committee, but we would be relying, I think, on the mayor's office. Uh, yes, so the, this group has no budget. I guess I would need to figure out what that would be. Like what would we be, who would we be paying, how many people, how much, um, and then figure out, I don't even know how we would do that procurement-wise. You can't just go out and hire somebody. You have to put an RFP and go through that whole process of reviewing the proposals. I mean, I've done that. It's actually not as sort of time consuming um, and <clears throat> sort of burdensome as it might appear, assuming you have some people available in your mind who sort of do this work locally um, who could potentially review. So, right now, it's just some information gathering. Um, I would view it more like we would probably have to put something out publicly to say if you have any interest in reviewing the charter and providing you feedback here's what we're offering and monetary consideration for that and then someone or a group would have to look at the qualifications they submit because you wouldn't be able to pick every single person or um, you would also want to make sure you have a good cross section of either all the boards or certain areas that you want to target and someone would need to review that also realizing that we're almost in September and we need to wrap this up by December. Sure. I think we're going to we quickly run out of time. It's not impossible, um, but yeah. I, I don't think we really have the people power to, to yeah. um, and the, the time to really look at building um, an organization around um, supporting the you know, looking at the charter. I think the idea is earlier of getting, at the bare minimum, the document translated mm -hmm. into Spanish and distributing that. As I had mentioned before, we could post meetings in Spanish, um, but that would only get to a very tiny population. And uh, But I, I think that that's like a reasonable accommodation that we could make. And that you and I talked about that we could do that. Sure. Um, but I, I think it would, with the amount of work that the charter has right now, um, it, it would mean, you know, a real stretch to get out to some of these communities. And as I said before, I did go to, to some of the communities, and I think that that, that the um, you know, the difficulty once again that Wayne mentioned is that uh, even when you go, it's you're not really going to be pulling people in. Um, I, I think that um, it might be better for us to sort of focus on what we can do right now um, that would involve, you know, the, the resources that we have, because we have no budget. It's, I don't think it's worth getting into a thing about trying to get money, because it is going to take time. It's a, if we don't have a budget, and look at the council, and get, get people on your side, it's going to become that's going to become the issue instead of how do we get the word out. I, I right. think that's no. I just I'm just sort of processing at this point. Um, 
But so my, my thought was that uh, you know we've spent a, we've done a lot of research, looked at a lot of information, and I think looking at some of Wayne, what Wayne said to us around you know how to get to communities is something really separate from the charter and what we. Oh, you know, the only other thing I thought of is that we could publish um, in the paper that there, the charter is going to be published in Spanish, and that came out of our meetings. And I think that would be a, a good, you know, a good change, reaching out. But no matter what we do, we're not going to get the, to the homeless, undocumented, and you know, everybody else in the community without a really a huge effort. Um, but I think that the, you know, the thought about re-energizing democracy and moving forward with that and another venue is a really good one. Um, Sam? I think Stan had thrown this idea out months ago of having our meetings elsewhere, and I think that's the simple thing that we can do, and we can utilize pre-existing groups and let them know ahead of time we're coming in, this is what the Charter Review Committee does. And, you know, for example, like Mary Cowie has organized a free community around Jackson Street and the apartments near there, it should be a free person to say, hey, could you help us with this? We can put it, we can print out copies of the charter. I have no problem printing out copies of the charter. And we can very quickly throw something together, what it is we do, so if, when we hold these meetings, if there's public comment, people aren't hearing about what the charter is right then. Right. So this is where we would need to reach out to any community. I, I understand we're not going to reach everyone, but we shouldn't let perfection
I wonder if we could, I don't know whether the Gazette does this, but could we publicize in other languages? Um, Maybe just a press release or something? Uh, Gazette has not done that. Inquire about it, I suppose. <laughs> we, uh, we have a Spanish speaking representative who is out here today. Well, hey! I wouldn't be able to make a mistake. Yes. Yeah. But you exist, so I don't so know. Still uh, Natalia Munoz yes. used to be involved with a Spanish presentation. And I'm not, also not sure. Does he have to go with that? So Latino, certainly, yeah. uh, if that's what you're talking about, but Manuel Ramos would be the one to get in touch with about that. Can you say that again? What, what was the recommendation? Uh, El Sol Latino is the, is the um, is it monthly or is it bi-weekly um, newspaper? Uh, it's run by Manuel Farrell Ramos. He's a super well-known. Okay. Uh, Local figure, um, they're bilingual. They publish in English and Spanish. So, thanks. For anyone who doesn't have a past, you guys are Christians and important. I know. Yeah. <laughs> um, are there other things, Molly, that you wanted to, to bring to the table? I just, I mean, those. So that's our thoughts. This terms of what we can do. It, and I'm totally with Patty. Um, unless people had sort of a surge of interest around something else, so it's so making these documents available in Spanish, et cetera, um, and, and sort of getting it out there and um, love the sort of uh, executing on the idea that, you know, hosting these meetings elsewhere. So maybe we can do that for the next um, meeting and Petty and I will figure out who should be that person to call, et cetera. Any other thoughts? From Sorry, you? one more. Um, yeah. So this is clearly something we're struggling with and figuring out, how, you know, it's an important issue and but also not really sure how it fits into the charter. It doesn't mean that maybe Alan can speak on this, that we couldn't include something at the end of our report saying we just we spent a lot of time on this topic and although we don't know exactly how it leads into the mm -hmm. charter, we do feel like it needs further examination and that maybe the council could create a select committee that mm -hmm. looks at these issues or kind of kicks it to the next step to say maybe there's a better arena that this conversation could happen in, mm -hmm. not just specific to the charter. I, I, love that idea. I also caution that when you're dealing with the charter, you're dealing with something that can only be amended by going to the legislature. So that's why we do things like what we're talking about here, either by ordinance or by by policy, not by charter, because it's you know it's really baked in there and it's really hard to bake it out of there. But certainly, what's been suggested. A matter of concern. Right. I like that. Yeah. Yes. That's right. Would be appropriate. Very mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So are we clear now on who's, who's doing what? Lynn's going to get more information about translation, and but specifically about looking at that code in the uh, on the city website. That would be great. That could, uh, uh, go, go, uh, yeah, translate I think you just document. apply that HTML code. Yeah. That would be the best case scenario. And Stan, could, is it possible to do some follow-up around Dusty's suggestion for publicizing in another paper or? Yes. Great. Yes. Yes. I mean, the next, if we are going to publicize these, these meetings, then and, and, and we could um, certainly reach out to, to them. Um, all right, so you're going to, the subcommittee will reach out to Mary Cowie. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, to do uh, host meetings at, for example, mm -hmm. like Pioneer Valley Work Center, or like to send that. information over yeah. to start the conversation. Yeah, yeah, we're going to do that. Yeah. Do you have other suggestions, Sam, besides the uh, Mary Cowie um, in terms of Pioneer Valley Worker Center, Housing Authority, uh, Casa Latina? Any other pieces? If you really want to dive deep, the schools. Oh, 
adjustment calendar, they're, they're not going to be able to give you information. Yeah. You, know, you just have to try, like you just have to give them the information and hope they have the time amongst their many duties to get it out. Just sharing information in the school with particular sure. professionals. And should we have that information available in different languages? Should we have it? I would ask them because every school has their own population. Uh, do I have any other thoughts? On the Housing Authority, I think it's uh, most useful to, to approach the individual tenant associations at okay. the various buildings rather than trying to deal with the I think every building has a some form of tenant association. And that was that was uh, you know we learned anything from that re-energizing democracy project about uh, the success of, of of community outreach. I think though you know working with the tenant associations were as successful as anything. Great. conversation with Amy Nee, who is a lawyer at the State Ethics Commission. Mm -hmm. She cautioned me, and I've spoken with Amy many, many, many times over the years, and never before has she ever been so adamant about being very cautious about how we proceed in this situation. Mm -hmm. She pointed out, and you know, conceptually, it didn't really occur to me that um, what we're really doing is regulating the conduct of the non-municipal employee. So in other words, we are not regulating the, the conduct of the elected official. We are now regulating conduct of somebody who is completely unaffiliated with the city and not permitting them to apply for a job or not permitting somebody to run for office because their immediate family member is an employee. And this conflict of interest law does not regulate the conduct of non-employees. And that's what was so like off-putting about this whole thing, and I never really could put my finger on it, but that's what's off-putting about it. Uh, I had uh, a long talk with the mayor, of course, this, this, this you know, was initiated by the mayor, and he understood the point. Uh, I'm concerned that, for instance, if you say to a person, you cannot run for office because your immediate family member is an employee of the city. Are you then interfering with the First Amendment equal protection and due process rights of people who want to run for office? Um, <laughs> I have a supporter right yeah. here. Um, so so um, it's, it's, uh, it's a little tenuous. Uh -huh. I think that the mayor would be satisfied at least with regard to the school committee and Smith Folk, that while serving as a member of the governing board, that immediate family members not be hired during the period of service. But that's about as far as I would recommend going in either case of the city, the uh, school committee or uh, uh, Smith Folk. Uh, the mayor is really there's no way that uh, that a mayor, a strong mayor like ours, who is going to be signing every every uh, change in employee status form, can hire 
uh, maybe a family member, because that regulated the conduct of the actual employee. This employee cannot hire, participate in the hiring of a family member, and it's really not possible for the mayor to delegate that because he can only delegate it to somebody who is subordinate to him. And so there's really no way the mayor, I don't think it's necessary to put that in for the mayor, but um, because I don't think the mayor can hire his immediate family members. Well, that was the question that we, that right. was the root question right. we had right. about the mayor. Right. I, I saw one case where the Ethics Commission uh, took action because a mayor hired his daughter to staff his office. Wow. Um, the, uh, and then there were other cases where a mayor couldn't, you know, um, uh, have a subordinate do what, what he or she couldn't do. So I, I think that the mayor is pretty, um, you know, that would be somewhat overkill. I mean, you can put it if you want to, but it would be somewhat overkill. Um, and I would go no further than to prohibit the hiring of an immediate family member of either a school committee member or of a Smithville trustee while, sir, while that person is serving. Well, you had a conversation with the mayor who I did. brought this to us. Does the mayor now feel that, does he share your opinion that yes. it's overkill? Yes. Well, I, I, I'm not going to put the word overkill in okay. his mouth, but he understands that there's no way that he, I mean, it, with regard to the mayor's position. It's unnecessary. It's unnecessary. I think he probably put it in there just because, you know, he was yes. <laughs> proposing to impose it on other, yes. you know, uh, other, uh, uh, branches of our yes. government or yes. other entities. Okay. So um, I heard from um, a former uh, school committee member, a current school committee member. I heard from member, I might have heard, I heard from the same line. Line. I did too. And then I heard through the grapevine about some school committee members' conversations with a relative of mine and then two of my neighbors' contact. It was in multiple conversations. And the school committee member and the former member um, really strongly disagreed with some of the information that I used to explain why this particular um, uh, um, proposal came forward. And they said that they, in fact, spent very little time on some of the budget and that, in fact, school committee members speak uh, or, or discuss, um, you know, the, the kinds of things um, that they, they were elected to do or to make the school committee represent, you know, the kids in the various schools, how to improve the quality, that kind of thing. Um, whether certain kinds of um, programs should be implemented. They said they had a much broader uh, uh, role than the budget, although the budget was of course essential and specific. One school committee member said that there was at least one other who in all the years he had been on the school committee had only excused himself once from negotiations um, and is married to a, school, a person. But that, excuse me, that school committee member who excused himself once from negotiations, I think his partner was in one of the bargaining units. This year, in these negotiations, there were, I think, six bargaining units? It was all well, So all the bargaining units worked together, and that's part of the reason why this came up. That isn't true every single year, and it hasn't been. There have been times when bargaining units have joined together. This was unique this year, and won't occur every single year. It was a decision made by the unions to work together and present their proposals management. Now having been very involved in labor for my whole life, I, I know very well from year to year that bargaining units don't always continue to work together and they have grievances amongst each other and they often don't see the unity involved. In fact, there were some problems with one of the bargaining units who was unhappy with the outcome. So, so one, th this situation did not, doesn't happen every year, it only happened this year. The school committee member I spoke to and the former disagreed with the information. They thought I was very misinformed. And then the neighbors also suggested that we should have invited the school committee to discuss it and get our information directly from school committee members who are active now. And that we, it was presumptive to 
look at this information and, and um, uh, accept uh, all information at face value without discussing what their real roles were with those who were in, you know, sitting in those roles. I think there, there, that there were people who really disagreed. And I, I did not seek out any of these people. They all sought me out. And um, I thought their arguments were very reasonable. And I, I, you know, and I think it's significant to know that this isn't something that happens every year. This year, all, the, all those bargains were together. And this year, it happened. And the other thing I think is, we could be making a decision, <coughs> suggesting about pro proposing a change to the charter, and there are people who sitting on the school committee with effects, and we're moving forward with something without informing them. And where we did invite, you know, the city clerk, and we did invite the city council in to talk about some of the important issues that were involving their roles, um, the kind of power they have, whether, in, but we didn't do that with the school committee, and so I, I think that's sitting out there. Um, so I would suggest that if we continue, uh, if we are really looking at having um, uh, a discussion that is better informed, that we should involve school committee members or at least invite them. I I had also heard from one current school Probably committee member, saying, yeah. right? And, you know, he, he opted for trans performance, but uh, he said he would be here next week. Yes. Oh, he did. Yes. 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 And just uh, for clarity. Um, I, too, have heard several times now from my confident who uh, took issue with um, with the way that the, the mayor characterized the uh, impact on, on school committee members. Uh, he disagrees with the mayor, and I invited him to, um, to uh, come and, and talk with us, and uh, as Alan said, he Get other plans for today, but we'll be here on September 3rd. Yeah, I might add there were others. I mean, I did speak to yes. a former, and then yes, yes. there's a great line, there's another one as well. So, yes. um, are there others yeah. here who uh, have um, comments? I was uncomfortable from the get go with this, mm -hmm. and, and mostly because you talk, you're looking at excluding a large pool of potential people who may wish to serve a school community. Very important positions. Um, it's been it's been one of our hallmarks that we that in everything. A lot of the stuff we've done so far is to encourage participation, and this would this would diminish participation in a big way. You know, I just don't like. All right. So to summarize, um, uh, we now. We seem to be in agreement that, in, in, in relation to the mayor, uh, any uh, uh, prohibition on hiring immediate family members is unnecessary. So we'll take, we'll simply take no action. Um, I don't see the need to, or any further discussion or action on, on that. Right? Uh, I guess that's up to Well, that, that's, that's your opinion. That was my recommendation. We have already voted uh, against uh, imposing that kind of a prohibition on city council members. So we're down to the school committee, which we did take some action on, uh, and then by extension, the Smith School Board trustees. And what Alan has told us tonight is that his recommendation would be that we, uh, if we are going to uh, impose this kind of a prohibition, that it would why only while the school committee or Smith School trustee is serving that during that period there will be you no know, hiring of any of them. Does, does, so I, I, I'm in agreement that um, we should seek, uh, we should give school committee and, and Smith School trustees the opportunity to speak to that. Um, does anyone want to that we rescind the vote from last meeting on the school committee, which we agreed that we would prohibit media family members from serving in the Northampton Public School Board. I moved to do so. I moved to rescind that vote um, and reconsider after speaking to school committee members. All right. Is there a second? second? Okay. Session? 
I disagreed with some of the arguments that were made. I heard some of the arguments that were made by school committee members, and I actually disagreed with them. Mm -hmm. um, and I still do think that there is an impact, a significant impact. And it's a little troubling to hear. I mean, I guess I'd rather hear it directly from the person who will have that conversation, but it's troubling to hear that um, the budget was seen as a small part of the job. I would. I didn't mean to characterize it that way, but that it was a, it was a field of fire that uh, this year in contract negotiations it was much larger because it was a contract. Yeah. I'd rather hear from them because no, I don't sort of, because I, I don't want to mischaracterize the yeah. position. But there's also laid out duties for a school committee. Yes, yes. The budget. The budget. You one of them? No, one of them. Like they're, obviously the school committee doesn't but mm -hmm. a lot of it comes out of decisions made by the budget. Mm -hmm. So having two people not involved in something, especially something that was so big this year, mm -hmm. I thought was really detrimental. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, you know, I would like to hear from committee, but I, I would like to know like, if, from someone who did feel that impact what, what it meant. I mean, it would be useful to me to really consider this. If, if you as a parent, well you for example, yeah, that, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. I directly say felt the impact. What it was that is it that you didn't get information? Like, what, what there wasn't the, the full committee that we've elected to represent us wasn't at the table. Mm -hmm. They can't participate in any of these conversations. So, I but mean, wasn't it just about bargaining? That's what I'm confused. It's about. bargaining and the and the budget. They were actually weren't. So one of the things that I heard and again, this is going through a lot of people, is that they were advised, oh, you could just vote on part of the budget. During the meetings, the public comment was from teachers and staff members, like, cut this from the budget to fund us. There's no way you can separate that. You can't say, well, I'm just gonna vote on this part of the budget. It affected the entire thing, so they had to completely recuse themselves. Mm -hmm. And as I understand it, from the State Ethics Commission, that wasn't really negotiable. It wasn't like, well, we recommend, like that lack, they could not vote on it. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, having. But how did it affect you as a parent? My representative was not involved in this at all. Or was mine. Yeah. And again, the fact that like this is a whole body we're supposed to have this broader representation of people. Two out of nine, nine, ten. It's pretty significant. And when you're having an executive session, like again, this didn't. This actually, it wasn't so bad this year. But you have to have a forum. And the more and more people you have, as I understand, there might be like some kind of emergency thing to do with that. Like if you really didn't have a form an executive, it wouldn't apply. It wouldn't apply. Uh, if, the only way the rule of necessity applies is if all of them have conflicts. Okay. So if you have two with conflicts and then two don't show up because they're on vacation, so then that you can't apply. use rule of necessity. Yeah. So. Or if you don't have a full complement of, of committee members, let's say you're down to eight and mm -hmm. three of them. Yeah. And another thing was it, especially this year with it being such a it was very contentious. The people who could not participate, they kind of had a, or not a, kind of a cop out for not having expressing what they think should be done. Which again, like we have less people actually forming what's affecting all the students. The budget, I mean, same with the city. There, a lot of stuff goes on all the time, but it, this is all directed by what's funded. Mm -hmm. And I have a kid at Bridge Street School, and funding was has been a really big thing. And so to not have my representative mm -hmm. able to participate was, it was really unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Would you agree that we should hear from school committee members before yeah, I, yeah, I guess that's really what I would like to do. I'd be interested to hear from the members that were able to vote and what yeah. they felt the impact was. Like, did they bear more the brunt of it? Did they feel like they lost you know, mm -hmm. a vital piece because there were two people that couldn't take that part? That would be more helpful if they would all choose to participate for a second of those. Right, right. Yeah. So I think if we're going to hear from one at the next meeting, we should put the call out to all of them, mm -hmm. including the yes. vote trustees. Yes. My, my proposal would be to uh, email all the school members and assistant trustees are 
discussion about a, a possible uh, uh, ban on uh, uh, family members having been employed in, within those departments, within those school departments, while they are sitting on the board. And uh, also, as specific, and say specifically that we're interested in hearing from them about the impact on the on their uh, work this year on budget and negotiations. Is that what, is that, does that reflect what we're doing? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we have put this, we've put a general invite out to all elected officials mm -hmm. and um, staff, and it wasn't targeted on these specific topics, but I'm wondering if we should extend it to the superintendents as well, because they're impacted yeah. by... Yeah. Yes, you mean, you mean the superintendents as well? And, and no, the yeah, mm -hmm. not the elected yeah, superintendent that's actual call, super but the actual study. Yeah, Andy Lincoln Hooker is the superintendent yeah. of the yeah. Smith Vocation School here. Yeah. Yes, yes, I, I, whoever. Um, they have an interesting role in this where they're specifically, you have to call the schools, the superintendent has an employee under him whose spouse is a school committee member who votes on that person's contract. It's, uh, All right. Um, any other discussion? No. Just a sign. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. Oh. oh, any other signs? Um, so the motion is to um, rescind the vote of uh, July 16th, which uh, uh, which uh, would recommend. Uh, not allowing any family members uh, uh, of sitting school committee uh, members to uh, hold jobs in the local public school, which is uh, which is different from what Al is now recommending that we ultimately adopt. So a, a yes vote would rescind that, and a no vote would be that. Uh, roll call, please. I'm sorry. Yes. So we're voting to rescind this, and then have a discussion about it next meeting? Like with the possibility of rescinding it, and then what if we have a discussion? We're like, we actually like it, then we would vote to put it back in again. The, the, what this would do is wipe this vote from, from our recommendations. And we are planning to have a discussion on September 3rd with, as we know, one school committee member plans to be here and any others who choose to come uh, about, I think, the, uh, the recommendation at that point will be hired while they are serving on the board. It would, it would not affect those employees who already are in place. Right, Alan? That's right. Okay. So yes, we will have that discussion on September 3rd for both the school committee and the state location. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hi, Huey. Yes, Huey. Yes. Molly Fox. Yes. Sam Hopper. No. Robbie Sullivan. Yes. Bob Morris. Yes. Ben Simmons. Yes. Do you want to <laughs> 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 I'm sorry, Stan. Stan Moulton. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> okay, so um, the vote was um, six to one? It was five to one. Okay, six to one. Can you count my vote? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, you can pick the ballot back up to you. Six to one. Six to one. In favor of rescinding that. Yeah. Okay. So, um, We will. We, uh, I will write something, uh, when and send it to you, and then you can send it to the school committee members, the fiscal superintendents, the superintendents of the two schools, and anybody else you think would be, we we should be fine. Okay, and we will have that discussion on September third. And that vote we just took was just for NB 
NPS? Yeah, we, 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 we haven't voted anything on specific vocational because uh, yeah. um, we wanted Ellen to do some research. Yeah. And, so, we're kind of, we're, we're, we're back to square one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. Progress. So, uh, the final item on the agenda is, um, is more discussion on uh, uh, the vacancy in the office section 3.9. And you, everyone was sent a, uh, an attachment, but we have a, a revised attachment, which uh, Amy uh, has not Thank you, Leslie. Yes, it's <laughs> Um, process is, you remember the last meeting, we um, pieced together some changes in Section 39 um, at Alan's suggestion, I then sent them to Pam to, uh, to have her expert eye review, um, review the uh, rather intricate um, elections that would be needed during certain times the mayor steps down. And uh, Pam put together an excellent uh, chart. Uh, it's very detailed. Uh, and she and Alan worked on, on drafting what I I saw as a very as a simplified and, and streamlined um, set of revisions that, that um, made a lot of sense. Since the attachment was sent last week to all of you, there was one further scenario that arose, which is section E. The first E, you'll notice that I didn't change the, yeah. the old E to F, but uh, yeah, the first E. First E um, in red. So that is new uh, uh, to you tonight. And what Alan has done is actually presented two options for consideration. Um, let's set that aside for a moment. And Alan, you just want to summarize yeah. what has happened in right. A, B, C, and D. Right. So in A, uh, calls for uh, the city council president, or he or she can serve uh, another council elected by the council to serve immediately as mayor while everything else is taking place. B, um, under um, section 8 1, there was going to be a special election held uh, to fill the vacancy until the next regular city election. In C, um, uh, and let me just preface this by saying that. That, uh, that Pam did all the thinking about this. I just put it into words, okay? Pam was the one who actually had to sit down and like pull all this apart and put it back together, and that's not something that I'm good at. Um, so, but I'm good at putting this into, into charter language, which is what I did. So C is the, are the procedural timelines for getting to that special election in 90 days, you know, when the nomination papers become available, when they need to be returned, certified, delivered to the clerk, etc. Uh, and in D, it, it, it accepts from that requirement of special election uh, if the vacancy is in months 16, 17, 18, 40, 41, or 42, because you're too close to the next and regular city election, and please, Pam, if I'm misstating this, uh, to have a, a special election. So in that case, the city council president or other city councilor elected would be the mayor until the next city election. E was something that Pam thought of. I don't know, like in the middle of the night when you're thinking about this, or when you're thinking about this. Well, what happens if the mayor doesn't run for re-election or is defeated? And then the day after the election says, screw this, I'm out of here. We haven't accounted for that in any way. And so now, this is where we get to the option. Does the city council president immediately fill the role and fill it until the new mayor is sworn? Or do we swear the new mayor immediately and, and let the mayor serve both the, the remaining mayoral term and the one for which he or she was elected? That's 
so that's the question for you. Uh, I need to make that policy decision. Um, and, and then F is, uh, F is just the payment for our serving as mayor. So we have carried forward the intent of a mayor, that, that, of a city council president serving on, only until the next regular election um, or until the special election, that the special election fill the, the vacancy until the next regular election. That's kind of the premise of all of this. Thanks, Pam, for your diligence on this. Well, I will tell you, when I sent you that first initial draft, I didn't get to the point, I think, that Alan sort of got me to after our discussion right. about thinking some of these things out. Yes. And yes. 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 So I think it, yeah. Yes. And it was a process. Also, yeah. I think we got there. I think this, this was I am. I appreciate it. No problem. So, um, does any 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 city members have um, questions or comments about before the really tricky stuff? Um, it, it C says that you're required to put out nomination papers within seven days of the vacancy. The B doesn't require that the city council call for a special election within that time frame. I think that's what we're, what we're so, you know, there, there's, when you have a 90 day window, there is a sort of sense of urgency that needs to be spelled out somewhere. And I think that this was the only way to define it. And what we're saying is that it doesn't the city council is going to have to call a special meeting to. It doesn't make that compel happen. them to do that. <coughs> It just seems to me you're required, you are required to do something, but they're not. It doesn't say that the city council shall call a special election. Yeah. Yeah. Right, but it doesn't require them to do it with a, a an emergency order. Um, we could add it. Well, I think you need to. I mean, if you, well, I guess one question is, can you, can you put out nomination papers within seven days if the council has ordered a special election? And the reality is, yes, I could. I would have to go by the charter and make the papers available. I mean, I could do it. There's. I'm not compelled to do it unless I get an order, but in reality, I write the, the orders for city council. Well, I guess that's oh, the question. I mean, that, that's the question. Can you put out nomination papers for an election, that the, for a special election that the city council hasn't called for? Hasn't yet called for? Uh, I mean, you're, you're asking me legally, can I, right? Is that yeah. the question? Yeah. I don't want you to get in trouble. We want you to be around for a long time. Well, I think, yeah. Uh, what, are you, what are you specifically suggesting? In what section? Look at B. Mm -hmm. Upon the vacancy in the office of mayor, the city council shall order a special election to be held within 90 days. But it doesn't say when. Within within seven days, within two days of the vacancy, within within what? And then and then it says upon C so C says upon the adoption of an order, the clerk shall set out the nomination. The nomination papers shall be made available in seven days of the vacancy. That would be impossible. Well, if you're saying that there needs to be a deadline for the ordering of the special election. Um, the, um, so what? What would cure this would be if in C it says nomination papers shall be made available in seven days of the setting of the of the special election. Right, but I think that I think that we're going to need to to solve this problem. We're going to need to have a provision that requires the city council to call a special emergency meeting. 
pursuant to the special emergency powers because th that's the only way we can get them to do it within seven days. That's what I said. Well, okay. I, I guess the reality of the process now is even when, when we have a normal municipal election, there is an election calendar that moves forward without having an order. In other words, I just got the order for the preliminary election that we'll be having September 17th. And yet, I made those nomination papers available back on April 2nd. So there is a process that's sort of defined without requiring me to have an order in hand. Certainly, but this is a special election. And the charter's built out for that process already, right? Like the, dead, the timing, that we have to have a preliminary on the third Tuesday of September. Or whatever. Spelled yeah, out certain things are spelled out in state law. But well, um, special okay. meetings of the city council shall be held at the call of the president or at the call of any uh, any three or more members for any purpose. Notice of, the, notice of the meeting shall accept in an emergency which shall be designated by the president. So uh, be delivered to each member at least 48 uh, weekday hours in advance of the time <laughs> set for the meeting. So we could require the, the, uh, the president to immediately call uh, emergency meeting of the council to to issue an order for a special election. That could be important because suppose they're disinclined to want to get a new mayor in there. I get it. Yeah. Okay. Do we define vacancy? Like is it if the mayor submits resignation? Is it the date the letter submitted or is it date that they leave office? The vacancy is when they leave office. I don't know whether vacancy is defined in the, uh, in the charter. Maybe it doesn't matter. Nope, not defined. Should it be? Do you feel it's generally understood that a vacancy is created when the office holder leaves that up? That's right. That's my understanding. You feel yeah, no, I was just thinking of scenarios. Like it doesn't necessarily mean the person dies or right. is immediately unavailable. Well, well, they, didn't Claire yeah, leave to go take a job yeah, up in yes. Greenfield? Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is not a hypothetical. Right. You know, she didn't run for re-election and then she left. Well, she resigned. She, right. she yeah. submitted a letter yeah. of resignation. Correct. That, then there was a vacancy as soon as she let, submitted the letter of of resignation. Well, as soon as she left the pot. Right, that's what right. I was wondering about. The effective date of the letter of resignation. Yeah. Okay. So when she, but she was out with an illness too. I don't know how long that was. Is that? Yeah, that comes under temporary absence. Yeah. 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 Temporary yeah. absence because we knew she was going to come back. Everyone knew she was going to come back. Right. Okay. Okay. So, Alan, you're in agreement with Bob's point that uh, there should be a clause in section commands the city council to yep. mm -hmm. uh, order a special election within a certain time period, right? Okay. Uh, other? Uh, I'm going to require them to immediately provide 48 hour notice to other councils for a yeah. special meeting to call a special election. Yep. Okay, I'll add that. Okay. Any other comments or questions or suggestions? Can I just have someone explain the new E again? Yes, I can explain the new E. Just one more time. Okay. So a mayor either doesn't run for re-election or runs for re-election and is defeated. And then the next day says, screw this, I'm going to Las Vegas. I'm done. What happens then? So I'm like between November or whatever. And November. I'm here. Right, so you have from November to the first Monday in January, that sort of 60 day period, the two month period, what happens during that two month period? Does the city council president just serve until the new mayor is sworn or does the new mayor get sworn immediately?
o'clock on a vote on this until September 3rd. That's my preference. Does, does anyone feel strongly otherwise? Okay. So I'll get you some revised yeah. language. So between now and then for the next meeting, if you'll add that clause in section E yes. and then keep section E with the options, because I certainly want to hear from Bill yep. about it. Mm -hmm. I'll, send, I'll make sure Bill gets it. Yeah. Okay. Thanks again for the front work on that. Um, Oh, Any other that, uh, makes my eyes roll in opposite directions. Okay, so we will return to our normal meeting schedule on the first and third Tuesdays uh, in September. Our next meeting is September 3rd. And uh, at that meeting, uh, I, I'd like to have a discussion about our our goals then and our, our, our sort of our set forth a, a, a map for the last four months of the year because um, we're now facing a deadline of it's about four months away. Um, our, our third meeting in September 7th. There's an election that night. Is, is, that, is, that, is there an election right? on September 7th? Yeah. 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 It's preliminary election. Okay, I'm sorry. Is a preliminary election only in Ward 7? Correct. Yeah. Uh, that's your board, Molly. Yes. Um, so you're most affected by that. Yes. So do you have any feelings about our meeting that day? Um, I'm very involved in Rachel's campaign. I'm sorry? I'm very involved in Rachel's campaign, so I imagine. Okay. But, you know. Well, uh, should we, should I have our second meeting on the fourth. Uh, although is that does have a calendar of, of holidays? Does that run into uh, Rosh Hashanah? Yom Kippur is in October. And then our November meeting falls on election day. Yes, I, that that I was aware of, and that's one of the things I want to discuss on September third. Um, but the immediate issue is um, the second meeting in September. Is, is Rosh Hashanah um, okay. 30th Rosh Hashanah? It is September Thank 30th. You, yeah. Okay, so would, would you feel better about not meeting on the 17th, Molly? Sure, I mean, but the community. Sure, I can't Okay. It's also possible the community could be without me.